I appreciate to be here. So, um, as Mr. Ford mentioned, I do work for the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I'm not on the National Forest. I'm with Research and Development. Um, we are a very small part of the Forest Service, for those of you who aren't aware. Uh, we are purposely not tied to a National Forest because if we were in the chain of command of somebody, of a ranger or forest supervisor, you all might be suspect if I find the results that the forest supervisor wanted, right? So we typically are not, we are not in the chain of command, but we certainly work on the National Forest. So we do research on what I like to say, the nation's forest. So I actually um, do work on um, federal properties, but I work on state properties, I work on private properties, and so forth and so on. Um, my background is uh, hardwood uh, uh, silviculture, and in particular, I'm mostly interested in regeneration, which I will sneak in some of that today, but I was tasked with um, talking about growing quality hardwoods, and my first caveat is I'm going to talk about growing quality upland hardwoods in Alabama. Uh, I have some work in the bottomlands, and we're probably going to have maybe some questions about the bottomlands, David and I both can certainly address those, but today's talk really is just focusing more on upland hardwoods. As I said, I, I'm located in, in Huntsville, Alabama. I've been there for about almost 20 years now. Uh, I do a lot of talking of, of, across the United States. There, there aren't really very many people that do hardwood silviculture, and we're becoming less and less and fewer and far between. Um, and so I like to always start when I go out west somewhere to put up a graphic like this. This is like kind of an old school map of the United States. And the green blobs on there are the national forests. And the big red blob on there is the Cumberland Plateau. And that's the area in which I have been directed to work. So I was hired by the Forest Service in Research and Development. I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, and I study the Cumberland Plateau. Um, but I like to put this up there because you all are, are really well aware of all of this. But um, the southern forests, which are the states that are circled. Now, I did not declare these as southern forests. The US Forest Service decided that those circle states are the southern forests. Um, uh, they they, uh, um, they uh, produce 18% of the world's pulpwood for paper and 7% of the industrial timber, while comprising just 2% of the world's forest area. And I like to put this up there with, with that caveat in particular because uh, a lot of my colleagues in other places um, still aren't allowed to use the timber work. We're still not talking a lot about timber, whether that's uh, through statute or through uh, cultural reasons uh, across the United States, from, from Maine to Oregon, I was in Arizona last year, uh, they actually floated a bond in Flagstaff, Arizona, to harvest timber on federal land, the, the town did, because the federals aren't harvesting timber because of cultural constraints and the public's animosity towards that, but the city of Flagstaff was concerned that if they didn't get rid of some of those big trees, they would have these uh, wonton wildfires that we're all hearing so much about, followed by flooding and so forth and so on. So I get to come and talk to people and say, no, oh, we have a very thriving timber market and uh, we still can say the, the T word pretty regularly and, and even more and more uh, as my career has, has advanced. Um, so with that, um, and I know that you're going to hear from, from Dan, and I already warned you, I'm not going to steal all of his uh, thunder here. But for those of you who aren't aware, uh, another part of research and development is forest inventory analysis. These are permanent um, measurement plots across the United States. Of course, we have them here in Alabama as well. And they re revisit these forested plots and come up with just an amazing amount of statistics about our forests. And I, I pretty much don't ever give a talk where I don't throw in some of the FIA data. So I just stole this from some of Dan's work, and he's going to tell you in more detail. But uh, when I talk to people about um, uh, the forest management in the south and put up that first graphic a lot of people think immediately start thinking pine and we certainly are grateful for the pine resources that we have um, especially here in Alabama but throughout the south because then it allows us to do the management that we need to do with hardwoods which takes a long time and requires a lot of patience most of us don't have that patience we're lucky to have some pines that don't require nearly as much patience but I put this up here, in Alabama we have 23 million acres of forest land. We have almost 17 billion live trees, I like those little fat boys. You probably won't remember it, David ruined this for me. I'm thinking no one's going to remember any of this. But it's going to be on the, on the website, so if you forget, you can go back on there and relearn it maybe. So. Anyway, so what we mostly think about is we, um, we think about our resource being loblolly shortly for pine, which is uh, 39% of our forests here in Alabama are. Uh, but when you move over to this part of the pie, you can see oak hickory is about 31%. And if you add in the oak gum cypress, you get pretty close to that same pie chart. 
um, at, as the pine. So I, I pretty much spent my uh, career in the South defending why we, we studied hardwoods, and so I always have to put up something like this and say, wow, it's, you know, it's comparable to the pine in your state. And a lot of people um, are often surprised by this. So, um, and I apologize to Mr. John here because he's seen part of this talk before. Uh, when I talk about hardwood management, um, I, I like to just take a step back in time and tell a little bit of history. So hopefully some of this will be of interest to you all, uh, if you, especially if you own hardwood stands. So um, does anybody recognize this character? Yeah, yeah Gifford Pinchot, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of eastern upland hardwood forest. So that's uh, in, in general what I'm going to talk about. So when I say how did we get the forest that we have today, I mean these eastern upland hardwood forests that we have. And we're going to try to grow this white oak in and, and all the other species that we have. And, uh, Gifford Pinchot was obviously, for those of you who don't know, he was the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service. I'm not forced to put him in here. I put him in here because I think he's an interesting character. Um, at the turn of the previous century, in the 1900s, we didn't have anything called foresters. Gifford came from a very wealthy family. He went uh, overseas and was trained as a forester, came back home, hung out his shingle. As a forester, people didn't have any idea what he was. He was either fortunate or not so fortunate then to be picked up by uh, the federal government at that time and said, hey, we might need somebody called a forester. He really uh, set the stage um, for uh, our mission, which is uh, caring for the land and serving people, and that came from Gifford. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the history. So a lot of you are, are well aware um, that the, the forests in the eastern United States were, were dominated by American chestnut. There's a lot of research going on. If you're interested about any of that, ask me. Uh, my really good friend and colleague works on American chestnut, and so I have some updates on that. But the chestnut blight really decimated our forest. One out of every four trees in some of these upland systems were uh, American chestnut, and they died. And when they died, it was a really uh, interesting way uh, for a disturbance to be introduced to a forest. Because you think of our one out of every four tree sort of dying in place. Um, they certainly went out and tried to salvage some of those logs, and they took some stuff out, but the trees just died. So this great big huge tree, one out of four, uh, think about the unique disturbance that that created. And when I go back in, um, I've done a lot of um, uh, recent looking back in, into the old literature uh, about upland hardwood forests, and this was from a publication in 1949. These guys were Forest Service researchers, and they, they were studying the forest at the time of the chestnut blight, and, and they, the, a quote from their paper said, following the ravages of the chestnut blight, in which about one-third of the total volume of hardwood stands was lost, adequate restocking. So Dave talked about restocking. Adequate restocking of large and small openings with desirable species took place promptly. Um, the other thing of interest to note is that these guys were totally not concerned about the chestnut leaving. Oh well, it's gone, what's next? Uh, there weren't any heroics done to save the American chestnut, or very, very little. Uh, there were some people who were concerned, but uh, this was in the, in the 1940s. We had a growing nation. We needed a timber resource, and we were just going to capitalize on what we had out there. So I always find that interesting when you go back. You don't see any heroics to try and save the chestnut, although they were interested in what came next. Um, and they said that it was, it was adequately restocked. Another thing that happened at the same time, again, we're talking about the, the turn of the previous century, was we had a lot of human demographic changes. And this is a graphic that came from researchers, um, Delcourt Delcourt, who are now retired there at the University of Tennessee. And they kind of tried to do a lot of reconstruction of stand history and stand disturbance um, using pollen and other sediment records. And so this, in particular, came from um, uh, pollen um, records. And so as you can imagine, uh, pollen and other particulates <coughs> fall into a bog or a pond of some sort, and the water covers it up, and it's a it's, a, it's an anaerobic um, environment which then preserves uh, whatever that particulate is. And they dig these big cores in these, in these bogs or ponds, and then they take the sediments out and they do all kinds of fancy things with them. And they can sort of recreate um, what, the, what kind of stand disturbance was going on, what the stands looked like, and so forth and so on. So this is some of the work that, that they did about looking at uh, fire history. Um, but I put it up here first to, to illustrate about um, human history as well. So what you're looking at is the time, and this is uh, 10,000 years ago, and this is the present, and then I just want to draw your attention to this, and this is the amount of charcoal they found in the bog. So a long time ago there was a little bit of charcoal, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, right here, 
uh, the amount of charcoal really increased. And this was the same time that the Native American populations were being removed or decimated and the European Americans were coming in. So uh, a lot more um, humans on the landscape, a different culture of humans on the landscape, and certainly uncontrolled fire on the landscape. And we know this from state history uh, in the past, that there was a lot of fire. Um, fire was not necessarily used as a, as a tool for forest management. It was more used as a tool to clean things up or get rid of things or open things up. And again, with all those humans, of course, came a lot more grazing. Uh, the livestock um, was allowed to, ran, uh, to run free in the woods. There was, there was no concern over that. Um, and also, with all those humans, came indiscriminate logging. And I don't mean this as, as a, um, anything detrimental to, to these times. Uh, when, when we moved south in, in, in the east and we saw these vast acreages of, of hardwood forests, Gifford Pinchot said, you know, we thought this was a, an infinite supply um, and to waste timber was a virtue. It was no big deal. We were so rich with timber that we wasted it. We just didn't, we weren't thinking about it back then. We had, we had different reasons. So all of these together, the chestnut blight, and the humans, us moving in and, 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 re and populating areas differently, fire, grazing, heavy logging, and we'll talk about weather, it's always in the background, sort of created this perfect storm of disturbance that gave us the forest we have today. So I always just like to plant that seed for people. Um, these forests were planted. Uh, our hardwood forests are not planted. They were, they were uh, native. They're natural. Um, and they're also probably not virgin. They've had a lot of disturbance in them, whether we disturbed them or other people disturbed them. Um, I skipped over weather real fast. I think we're really fortunate here in Alabama. We have all kinds of weather, right? We have hurricanes and tornadoes. We have floods and droughts. We have it all here, um, as well as uh, uh, snow at times. And I always tell people, we're really fortunate when we get snow or ice, it's usually right after our trees bud out. And so really get some. It's like a really good disturbance. So this is always a background of our forest. So we have growth. We have a birth, and we have growth, and we have senescence, and we have death, and a lot of this is just dictated by our weather. You can't control Mother Nature, it's going to happen, but you need to remember that that disturbance is always going to be there. And again, uh, an ode to FIA, um, they also look at mortality of trees based on different disturbances, and so he was proving my point here. A lot of trees in Alabama die from the weather. A lot of trees die from insects and fire and other things we've talked about. So and when we try to manage our forests, I think it's important to remember that disturbance history because what we're trying to do as forest managers is mimic that disturbance history. So I'm certainly not saying to you, since this is being videotaped, to do you know, wanton logging and, and burn as much as you can and let your cows loose. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you need to think about how those disturbances shape what we got today and see if we can mimic those. Uh, we can do things like make canopy openings, um, like the death of the chestnut, either uh, big ones or small ones. These are sort of larger disturbances. Uh, we can always introduce something like a prescribed fire, which are smaller disturbances. Or we can do some tending or cultural treatments that are very targeted disturbances. So this would be the use of herbicides or harvesting in these stands. So just uh, in summary, uh, there's an ecological leg legacy of change in our forest whether that's from the land use changes or human use changes or just disturbance changes. Um, these shifts in disturbance and forest succession have altered our span species composition and structure. Uh, we don't have the chestnut anymore, and that's probably the easiest one to go out there. And just remember that the mature stands of oaks in particular that we love so much, but oak and hickory and all those species, they're really a legacy of this mid 20th century land use. So you have what you have. You know, you've kind of, whatever you, wherever you are with your forest, you, you, you're there today with it. Um, you need to keep in, in mind the past disturbance that might have happened. But what we're trying to do is, is influence the future. And part of the way that we're going to do that is, is through natural regeneration. And so any regeneration I talk about today is all going to be natural. Uh, David covered the artificial stuff really well. So whenever you um, are trying to manage for quality hardwoods, the first thing to consider is where you are on the landscape. I'm not going to address that. You all know where you are. <coughs> My caveat to that is be careful of taking what somebody else did in a different landscape and applying it to yours. So remember, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's the same thing in our forest system. So what happens with your neighbor's property is probably very germane to something for you, but what happens in Virginia is not going to be as germane to the forest here in Alabama. So you, know, you have to know where you are in the landscape. 
And then the thing that for, you, for managing is the first decision that you need to make. And we like to report that the first decision you need to make is, are you going to manage the stand as it is? Or are you going to start the regeneration process? And David sort of alluded to that. That's a whole lecture or a, you know, a series of lecture in itself. Uh, I put this publication out here, up here. Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Ezell and others uh, put together a really unique way of trying to help people make this decision. Um, and so they, they looked at um, a bunch of different variables for helping to make that initial decision. So um, the first decision you need to make after you know the landowner goals is to either manage or regenerate the stand and how do you make that decision. Um, and they talk about all of these different things and I'm not going to go into these in detail but if you're interested I can make sure Lee gets that publication and we can make it available to you. But they talk about things like existing stand conditions, the species that are desirable or undesirable, stem quality, tree health, inherent site quality, and previous stand management. And these will all be part of my talk as well. Um, things like this, right? So this, I want to, I want to encourage you to take a look at this publication because it's all stuff that you can uh, take home. So how do you make um, a decision whether it's desirable or acceptable? If you're looking to grow timber, um, you can go down through uh, a decision model like this. How much height? What's the butt log grade? What's the vigor of the tree? And, and they detail all of this. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that. So things that are helpful to know in managing your existing stands are your site quality and your silical requirements of your desired and undesired species. Now I've gone out on a big limb here because I've just thrown up their desired and undesired species and I'm going to defend which ones I've chosen as desired to laugh at and undesirable, but you may have a different take on this and more, more open, as he said, it's free speech. We're open to uh, uh, other people's interpretation, but I'm gonna defend the species that I chose as desired today. I don't have anything against the other species. I've been accused of being a little bit of a species snob. I like all the native species. <laughs> I have just chosen a few today to talk about. So the first thing is you need to know uh, where you are in the landscape and, and something that's your inherent um, productivity of your, of your site. So, so for me, I work in the Cumberland Plateau and I usually just divide it up into two very, very broad um, areas. And just looking at these pictures, you can tell there's something different about these sites, right? The, the plateau or the escarpment is the side of the plateau and where I have the plateau, that's the top, the tape the top, right? So right away, these pictures were taken on the exact same day. You can see there's something different. So on the escarpment on the side of the plateau, these sites are much more mesic. So think about that graphic that David wants you to remember. Don't forget the graphic yet. So these sites are much more mesic. They have higher fertility. Usually uh, water is not a limiting resource here and we have lots of competition. We can have anywhere from 30 to 95 different species in any one stand. That's a lot of competition. And when I talk about competition, I'm usually talking about competition to oak, because yes, I have chosen oak as one of my desired species. What's advantageous about the escarpment is that you can grow high quality timber here. And you can grow it pretty fast compared to some other sites. Versus the plateau or the, uh, the top of the plateau or the tabletops, these are much more drier sites. Um, they're, they're much less fertile than the side. Um, water is a little more limiting. And oak is, it competes really well here. Not really. Oak does well here because oak is a really bad competitor and there are less competitors. So it's not that it competes well here, it just has less to compete against and it does better under those conditions. Um, so you think, well this would be a great place to grow oak and it absolutely is. The problem is that your high quality oak is going to be more limited on the top than it is on the side, and it's going to take you longer to get there. So the guiding principle of civil culture is tolerance, and for those of you who have kids and grandchildren, you realize this is a guidance, guiding principle of life, perhaps. Um, and when I'm talking about tolerance, I'm talking about how a species is tolerant to light, space, moisture, and competition. So we talk a lot about shade tolerance, but some species don't really have a lot of tolerance to being crowded, so space tolerant. Some species, as David reviewed, don't like dry sites or wet sites, so moisture tolerance. And some species, as I alluded to, oak, don't really like competition, so that would be tolerant to competition. And what it comes down to is density control. That's what I can do in a forest in order to guide my tolerance. I can take out trees and change the light, space, moisture, and competition. I can do all of that. So that's what we're really going to talk about. 
The problem with density control and silvical requirements of trees are, in these highly diverse mixed species stands, what you do for one tree, you're going to do for other trees. And that is uh, uh, illustrated by this graphic here. This is a really old graphic, and we don't really do this kind of work anymore. But what it's showing is the general desirability for timber production. So these are, you know, black locust is moderate, sugar maple's high, oaks are high. The degree of tolerance to shade. This happens to be just to shade. So they're either high, intermediate, or, or low tolerance, and then the site for the best development. So I just want you to look at the red maple and sugar maple here. Um, uh, pretty high for their desirability. Um, the degree of tolerance, it's like ditto. So it was high up here, and they like intermediate to moist sites. And if you look at northern red oak, I've circled there, and white oak, hmm, they're very highly desirable. They're intermediately tolerant to shade, and they like intermediate to moist sites. So what you do to try to increase the growth of these trees, if these trees are in your stand, they're going to respond as well. That's, that's just the conditions that we work under. So we're going to talk about trying to introduce the most economical way to provide environmental conditions that favor desired reproduction, but also maintain good growth and quality in the mature stand. Does that sound like something you all are interested in? <laughs> okay, good. Right, that's going to stay up there in that color. So really we're going to talk about stand density in hardwoods. Um, Hardwood stands develop at a very high density, and David also, you know, we, we weren't in total cahoots over our talks, so David was way ahead of me and had his talk together, and so I knew he was going to speak about some of these things. So again, maybe if we tell him twice, David, he'll remember it some more. So hardwood stands develop at a very, very high density. You can see a, a picture of it there, and, uh, you know, as, as that um, newly regenerated stand grows, it is thick as dog hair, right? The problem with this density is that it's often understocked with high quality trees or desired species. So David talked about what high quality were, I'm going to talk about what desired is. And this is because of stand history, right? If you picked out the best and you left the rest, at some point, you're going to have things that are not desired or not high quality. Um, it could be that it was burned and it killed some trees over others, grazing or just general mismanagement. So this is... This is a little chart of data, and I promise you I'm not going to be like data crazy. It's really hard for researchers not to put up a lot of data. I took out all the statistics, but there are going to be a few graphs. I'm just going to warn you. So this was from a study that I have been following in Jackson County, Alabama since 2001. Um, this was put in with the Mead Corporation. And I put goals up here, um, and, and I'm going to tell you what the goals were. But I know while I'm talking, you're all going to be looking at this. So this is for stems that are an inch and a half and greater. These are stems per acre. I'm going to tell you about the different treatments. All species. And then these are the species that I've chosen to, to, uh, as my desired species today. So I'm going to talk about oaks, and I lumped red and white together, sugar maple, and yellow poplar. So the goals on this site, this was Meat Corporation. They're timber. They were a timber company. So obviously one of their goals was to grow and sustain high-quality timber. That was one of their goals. Another one of their goals was to have a profitable harvest but leave good timber in the stand so they could have another harvest 10 to 15 years later. And while doing all of that, they wanted to sustain or maintain or enhance the establishment, growth, and recruitment of oak seedlings, of the next stage of oak. So they really, they wanted to do it all. They're now out of business. I don't, think, I don't know if that speaks to this or not. I just thought of that just now. No, I'm kidding. Um, so that was the goal. It was not a thinning, and this is why it wasn't a thinning. The stand was too old. Now, we left quality uh, trees out there, but they were already 100 years old. So think about if you are 100 years old. If you know somebody who's 90 years old, right? Let's say grandma. And you give grandma everything that she needs to get bigger, stronger, faster, right? Let's give grandma a nutritionist. Let's give her a personal trainer. Let's give her everything she can need. In 10 years, is grandma going to get stronger, bigger, faster? Probably not. Yeah, it wasn't a thinning, right? The goal of the thinning is to put the growth on the residual trees so they get stronger, bigger, and faster. That's not what the stand was 100 years old. They weren't going to do that. They also weren't going to increase in grade in 10 years. Uh, a really good site, but older trees. So we're at the end of rotation. So the goal was actually a two-stage shelter wood, but each of those shelter woods were purposefully put in to make money. 
So, uh, so that was the goal behind it. So, let's see what, so this is what it looked like. We had about 120 square feet of basal area up there. This is a very typical, um, very productive escarpment upland hardwood stand. Um, so pre-treatment, we had um, about 347 stems per acre. We had 29 oaks, 128 sugar maple, and 16 yellow poplar. Let me get a little caveat here. Half of these sugar maples were pretty small. These weren't all big, so half of those were more soft, soft timber size, and half of these were about six or seven inches. So the first thing we did was we cut it to 50 square feet of basal area, and that's what it looked like. I have to tell you, it looked really nice after we cut it. It was really uh, a nice cut, very pleasing. And also, we did a lot of work in here with wildlife. Um, the birds, the uh, migratory neotropical birds, loved this type of disturbance because they still had canopy, but they had all this growth in the understory. And that's just a caveat. So we cut it to 50 ba. Um, we cut it down. There was 112 stems per acre left. There were 11 oaks. I told you we didn't we didn't high grade it. We didn't diameter limit cut it, and we didn't thin. We just cut across all species and all diameters. We took out some of those sugar maple and a few of the yellow poplar, and then we let it grow for 11 growing seasons. Had to do with, with uh, um, things that we were going through and, and then we're out of business. And we went back and we cut it again. Now, I will tell you this, if we still own this property, we would have cut it harder the second time and completely regenerated the stand. The second cut, where we went down to 37 square feet of basal area, they picked. They went in and picked at it which is what a lot of us do in our stands, right? We go in and pick. They took out the best, so you can see what they took out. They definitely took the rest of those oaks out of there. They took out some of the sugar maple. This is two years post, and so now we're accruing or we have bean growth. Um, and they took out the larger yellow poplar, but we have a lot of yellow poplar coming in. So this is what that looks like graphically. So this is stem spray acre. That's that same table you've been looking at. I said pick, pick, pick. So here's what we had pre-treatment. These are all species that oak, sugar maple, yellow poplar. This is that same graph without the all species because it makes it hard to pick up the oak, which is so small. So we picked across all of these species. We let it grow, and then we picked again, and we're now letting it grow. And I hope you can right away see that at this point, we sort of converted this stand away from oaks towards maple and poplar was not necessarily our goal, but that's where we are today. We're going to talk about this once more. So one of my uh, colleagues who recently retired, Gary Miller, was an economist with the Forest Service. He worked in the Northern Research Station, and he put together this uh, little study years and years ago. Um, and so this is for a stand that was 53 years old, site index 70, which means that the oaks were about 70 feet tall when they were 50 years old. So pretty, pretty productive site, not highly productive, but not a terrible site. And what he did was he looked at the number of trees per acre that were out there. So there were a total of 441 trees. And then he looked at the percent that these 10 trees contributed to basal area, volume, and value. Now this is a little bit older study. So I don't know if this would hold true today. I don't follow the timber value, so I can't help you there. But what he did was he, he did 10 trees, 20, 30, 40. And what he found was 50 trees in this stand contain 93% of the volume. Now he's done this for many, many stands, and he's not the only one, so this is a, a pretty true um, statement for our hardwood, mixed hardwood floor. So 50 trees, 90%, 93% of the value, 48% of the basal area, almost most of it. And if we look at the stand I just told you about, this is pre-treatment, if we add up these oaks and take the best of the yellow poplar and best of the sugar maple, these are the 50 trees that were more than 50% of the basal area. Those were the best trees in there, just like Gary indicated. So what we want to do is create the conditions to favor one hardwood species over the other. We wanted oak. To have any real influence, we're probably going to have to have a cost. We're going to have to put money into these stands, and I'm going to tell you why. The density management and complementary regeneration practices are needed, or we're going to convert those stands. So what I just told you about, we made money from, but we moved the stand from being dominated by oaks to being dominated by yellow poplar and, and sugar maple. Not that there's anything wrong with those. The goal was to keep oak in that stand. So um, talk a little more about density in hardwoods. In general, the trees in the red oak group are going to grow faster than trees in the white oak group under the same density and site conditions. We don't have time today to go into all those specifics, so I'm just lumping oak together here. 
Um, what we want to do is we want to develop a moderate number of stems per acre that have a good proportion of clear bull. And Dr. Berker talked a lot about what the value was. We want to manage what we have. We want to direct the growth to the best trees. Let's not waste our time having any directed growth to trees that are going to be crappy to begin with. They're not going to get better. Grandma's not going to get better, stronger, faster. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to talk about crop tree management um, for these young stands. Go back, sorry. So two years after we did our, our second cut in there, we didn't have any oak, so we don't have any pear trees left. We had some sugar maple and yellow poplar. But if we look at the regeneration, and David mentioned that, so anything that's in the regeneration, the bigger the better. So this was the biggest regeneration out there. There was more regeneration than just this. This is just all the big ones that are four feet tall, up to an inch and a half in diameter. We had 60 oaks per acre out there. So mom and dad are gone, but we still have the progeny. They're still out there. So we can still lifeboat this species if we do something to maintain these. Because if we don't, not only are these going to continue to grow, but these guys are going to take over, especially this one here. So what affects values? What are the best trees? David went over this really well, but obviously size, species, quality, and the product market. And if I had a crystal ball, I could tell you which species are going to fetch the highest value 60 years from now. Unfortunately, my crystal ball is broken. I don't have a crystal ball. Who would have ever thought hickory would have gone through the roof in the early 2000s, right? Who predicted that? Luckily, we, we searched and we researched our stands, and we had left the hickory so much that we had the near quality hickory, right? Who would have predicted the hickory? Same thing with the white oak. I mean, there's probably futurists out there that could do this, or gypsies, I'm not sure. But if I had a crystal ball, um, one of the things my crystal ball would have done would have probably pointed out these trends. And David looked at these, and, and these uh, came straight from Lee. I think this is why I got excited about having people talk about hardwoods finally. So if we look at this trend, this is from Timber Mart South from 2000 to 2015 for pine. It's a, it's a downward trend. We're not going to get stuck in the numbers. And if we look at uh, hardwood saw timber in the red and then Alabama in the blue, it's an upward trend. So who would have predicted this? I don't know. Maybe there are futurists that do predict it. However, what we can also predict is we can look at what the global markets are. Right? It used to be uh, we, were, we were much more... Um, uh, local and domestic. Uh, most of the hardwood market is really going international. These are two guys that work for the Forest Service that are economists, and this is what they study. They recently gave this talk in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I apologize for the quality of it. I took a picture of their talk, and, that's, and I have written to both of them and said, can you please send me the slide? And I like just use the picture. So I'm just going to use the picture. So this is what these guys do. They study um, hardwood uh, lumber exports. Um, from 2007 was the data they presented to 2017. Um, my take home here is that it continues to go up. It's being dominated by China, but these four countries, um, the, the market is very strong right now, especially in the international market. And here's the reason I chose my desired species today. If we look at what, they're, what we're exporting by species, um, from 2000 is the first bar, and then the black bar is the most current. You can see the oaks, Remain really dominant. Poplar is up there. Uh, maple. Of course, this was a lot of salvaging of ash. We can talk about that. And then walnut and cherry. So that's kind of defending my um, desired species that I chose. So let's go back to talk about a hardwood stand. So if you look at the number of trees in a hardwood stand, remember they, they come in and they're in a really, really high density. Um, by age 20, so this is the number of trees in hardwood stands by different ages. Um, these are for all stems that are, are one inch or greater, and it's in um, trees per acre. Um, and this column is dominant or co-dominant. Um, dominant, um, even though these look like trees, I'm really talking about smaller trees, not necessarily the mature trees. But dominants are anything that gets sun from the top, and they get sun on the side. You see the Ds? Co-dominants get uh, a lot of sun from the top, not really much sun from the side. And then I'll talk a little bit about intermediate trees. They get just a little tiny bit from the top and uh, are barely keeping their heads up there. Uh, dominant and co-dominant are the trees that have the best chance of making it. And if we look at that and then look at crop trees, um, crop trees for this example are the ones that I chose, which were uh, yellow poplar, northern red oak, sugar maple, anything of good quality. <laughs> 
So if we look through a stem at age 10, we have 2,600 stems out there. Um, we have 837 of those that are dominant or codominant positions. And we have a whole bunch of crop, crop trees, about 145. But by the time we get to age 20, the number of dominants or codominants have dropped down to about 300. And the number of these 300 that I would consider a crop tree has dropped down to 25. So between ages 15 and 20, or between ages of 10 and 20, we really have uh, a decline in the number of crop trees. And I'm going to say this is our window of opportunity to get into these stands and do something. Because if we don't lifeboat our crop trees now, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone from that stand. So how many crop trees uh, do we want in a young stand? Again, this is just that same point. Maybe we say it over and over again, and it, it, it rings true. This is just the number of trees. This is just that graphically again. Um, this is the stand age, so this is when it got cut, and this is the first measurements we made. So you know, the number of trees decline, natural mortality over time, um, as do the numbers of dominants and codominants. And if we look at the crop trees, um, we don't have very many to begin with because we put a lot of caveats on those trees and they decline pretty rapidly and then, you know, some of them maintain but a very low number. So the crop tree management practice in these young upgrading stands has these six steps according to me. Um, we set the stand management objectives. We can talk about those in general. You have to define the crop trees based on these objectives which I just took the liberty to do. You inventory the trees and the competitors. You project the development of crop trees, which I want to share with you. Plan and adjust the release treatment and then apply the treatment um, that you plan. Okay, so what are your objectives? Well, obviously the objectives are to look at what we're going to predict in the future to be more valuable species. These were my objectives for today. And what I want to do is choose the, what I'm going to think is going to be the most valuable species the ones that have the best quality, even at a young age, and have a faster growth. That's what we want to do. We want to choose them, we want them to have good quality, and we want them to grow fast. But we always have good stewardship in the background, right? I know you're all here today learning because you want to be good stewards. So this does not negate looking at preferred species other than the desire, increasing diversity benefits. We're going to have plenty of diversity. I'm not saying knock out everything except for the desires. I'm just saying we're going to favor those desires. And of course, if you have anything unique, you know, you obviously want to protect that. And crop tree management allows you to do that as well. So what's a crop tree? It's a future overstory tree. And I'm going to argue today that it's, our crop trees are going to be our best 75 trees per acre. Remember how we went from 175 to 80 down to 25? I'm saying somewhere between ages 2 and 15, you want to try to pick out the best 75 trees per acre that you have out there. They're not all going to make it, but this is going to give you a pretty good chance of having desirable crop trees that would be, again, for timber reasons for today's talk, um, in, in the future, hopefully, will be beneficial. Um, market value, that's the crystal ball, we don't know. But other benefits are seed production and meeting these goals. And of course, there's always some type of risk. You know, hardwood, any forest management has some kind of risk. I said consider longevity. You want to choose crop trees that you think are going to make it through the rotation, right? That has to do with quality and vigor and the best trees that you can get. So our crop trees are dominance, co-dominance. We're going to have some intermediates, and this is going to happen out there. We're going to look at things like species, diameter, and crown class, so whether it's dominant, co-dominant. And we're going to look at its competitive status. And I'm not going to get into this into the nitty gritty, but here's competitive status. One, two, three, four. One, really competitive. Two, not as competitive as one. Three, not as competitive as two. Right, you get the idea. You can just come up with something. It could be your own thing. You can tell who's going to be competitive and who's not going to, not going to be competitive. If you have an intermediate tree, it's not going to get a competitive status of one. Right, it's going to get either a three or a four. Right? Okay. And then you do the same thing for, for your um, dominance and your co-dominance, and you do all of this by species. So what we want to do is we want to inventory our crop trees and our competitors, and then we want to project the survival based on this competitive status that I've sort of just made up, and then project the survival with and without a release, crop tree management. Either do the management or don't do it and see what happens. And you do the same thing with the competitors. We're going to assume 74, 75 overstory trees per acre, and like I said, 
all your crop trees probably aren't going to make it, but you have plenty of other out there. You're not going to decimate the whole stand and just have 75 trees. You're going to favor these 75 trees. If they die, some of the other trees that are working in the background will certainly take over. So here are my guidelines for projecting survival of our old crop trees. This is Ryan Sisk, who's worked with me forever, and he allows me to use this picture of him holding on to an oak crop tree. You're going to look at co-dominance or dominance at age 15, age 8 to 15. These co-dominants we found have a 50% chance of survival without release. So this guy here, who's a co-dominant, if we don't release him, he might he had, flip a coin. He may or may not die, 50% chance. But if we release him from his neighbors, he has a 90% chance with release. If you look at an intermediate, which I don't have a picture, you know, an intermediate wouldn't have its head up as that far. It would be in more of a position like this. It doesn't have much of a chance at all, especially with that yellow popper out there. So if we don't release it, it doesn't have much of a chance. But if we do release it, it has about a 20% chance of survival. And I mentioned there's going to be a lot of intermediates in your stand. <coughs> So this is kind of what that looks like graphically, and don't get scared by this, it's really pretty simple. So this is the effect of crop tree release on the survival of my oak crop trees. I'm just looking at oak here. Here's that, that really complicated research competitive status thing. One, two, three, four, right? One is going to be very competitive, four, not so competitive. Here's my crop tree inventory. Remember I told you that we had 60 oaks out there, we actually had 63 oaks out there. So five of those were the most competitive. These were my dominants. Twelve of those were co-dominants. And whatever that adds up to were my intermediates. Nineteen of these intermediates were sort of competitive, and 27 were the least competitive of this whole batch. If we don't do crop tree release, without crop tree release, here's the percent that are going to make it. These guys are going to make it. They already have their heads up there. Half of these guys, a third of these, and very few of these. And that's how many trees break or we end up with. We have about, we might be able to lifeboat 18 oaks out there for like lucky. If we do crop tree release, we change these percentages now to 95, 90, 60, and 20. We end up with 32 oaks break out, oaks break out there. So we bump this up considerably with what we had to start with. We move those numbers to this table. So this is uh, species composition with and without crop tree. I'm not going to go through what we did with everybody. Um, I will tell you this, the other, when we put the study in, was ash. We're no longer advocating ash as a desired species. The emerald ash borer is going to get it and wipe it out. It will be an orphaned, co uh, an, an orphaned reproduction cohort we don't know what to do with, but that's what other was here. And then oaks and then sugar maple and then our competitors. So I just moved those numbers in here. I'm not going to go uh, uh, over all these other numbers, but without crop tree release, we have 17 oaks, and with, we have 32. As you can see, with crop tree release, our stand will be 43% of oak versus only being 23% in the future. So these all add up to 75 trees per acre, and this is just the percent of 100. So essentially what we've done is taken these competitors that were going to be a, a huge contribution to the future stand, and we've moved them up here, and we've gotten rid of them in terms of their competitiveness in the stand. So how do you do this? Well, it's, uh, has anybody done any crop tree? I call it baby crop tree release, of course, or something like that. It's very difficult to do spatially. These are not, they're not going to be evenly distributed throughout your stand. Um, the best way to do it is to hire a professional who has done it before. That's the best way to do it. And this is probably what they will do. They will, um, what we did was we marked a demo plot. You can see the flagging in here. And we counted the number of crop trees and the cut trees on a per acre basis to get ourselves calibrated. And then I said, you show it to your staff, your contractors, your clients, the dogs. It's very difficult to do this spatially. I can't, can't uh, emphasize that enough. So not only are you trying to mark a stand that might be 30 acres, um, you're going up and down hill, and the crop trees themselves are not going to be evenly distributed. We hope to get 75 per acre. You might have a little clump here, and none here, and a strip of them over here. So it was very difficult to, to calibrate your eyes and, and, and be able to mark those crop trees. Um, you could always err on the side of marking more crop trees, right? As long as they're not competing with one another. Just, you know, if you get more, you can always take them out later. That's not going to be a problem. And then you just need to adjust the number of crop trees. So we overshot, we undershot, you know, we got better at it as we went along. And those of you who've done this are kind of nodding. Yeah, you get better at it as you go along. 
Um, so this is just a graphic of what I'm going to try to tell you to do. So these are the crop trees that we chose. I don't have a good picture of this, which is why I'm using the, gra the graphic. But what you're going to do is you're going to do a crown touching release of these crop trees. Um, so anything that's touching it on three or four sides, you're going to get rid of. I'm going to tell you how. So that's what it looks like before treatment. And that's what it looks like after treatment. And when I was showing this to Ryan, he said, well, they still look kind of crowded there. Are they crowded? And I said, well, no, because this is what it looks like from above. So that's that same graphic, but you're looking at it from above. They're not touching each other. I mean, that's the goal, is to make sure that they're released on all four sides. So it's a two, it could be a two-step process or a one-step process. We did it in a two-step process. This is us out in the field trying to make these decisions. We selected and marked the crop trees, and then a crew came in and released them. You know, if you have a talented crew, they can select them and release them, do, do both of those at once. Uh, how do we do this? Um, it's not very complicated. We use an herbicide, which is not a dirty word. It's very directed and very targeted. Uh, we did it using a mazapir at the time. It was labeled as arsenal. I think you can get all kinds of different mazapir now. Um, a very, very small amount of chemical, one hack per three inches in diameter. Um, the chemical itself is less than a milliliter. It's a very small amount. Um, you also could do some basil spraying if you have some smaller trees, and we used Triclopyr to do this. We didn't have a lot of one to two inch trees around our crop trees, so we didn't do a lot of basil spraying. You certainly can use a chainsaw to do this. The problem with using a chainsaw is I would highly recommend that you follow that up with an herbicide treatment. If you cut these little skinny stems, they're going to sprout. And those sprouts are going to be really competitive with the crop trees. So you can do two steps or you can do one step, but you're going to have to do this herbicide regardless. I put the cost up there. That's just totally a guess of a compilation from people that I've talked to. So that's not any, uh, I'm, I'm not going to defend that number, but that's probably a ballpark figure of what it would cost per acre. So crop tree management, we want to increase diameter growth, we want to improve stand quality, and we certainly want to improve or change the species composition by picking desirable species. Again, I picked some that you might not think is desirable, and you could do this on other species if you wanted to. So what does this have to do with oak sustainability? I'm almost done. I just have a couple more. Um, we talked about how we got our forest, so hopefully that's a good take home. Lots of disturbance. And we're hedging our beds to oak, and that's a lecture in itself. Some of this is economically driven, some of this is culturally driven, like our oak forest. Some of this is ecologically driven. We like wildlife that eats oak and so forth. We have a lot of parent oak trees out there. This is why the cooper ginger is doing so well. So we have moms and dads, and moms and dads are making progeny. We have a lot of young oak trees. We still have them out there. The problem is, if we start to remove these oaks, and we don't life bait, lifeboat these young oaks and carry them through, we are going to have a real problem with sustaining oak. We, we will eventually lose the seed source. It will be gone from our stance. Is it going to happen tomorrow? No. But with the heavy cutting that's going on right now, I just want everyone to caution everyone. If we lose mom and dad, there's not going to be any progeny. And we're not going to have any ability to keep oak in these systems naturally. We always can plant it as well. So the future is in these large seedlings. So we had these 60 oak, and we're trying to life oak those um, and carry them through to the next stand. Again, that's just what it looks like graphically. I get a lot of questions about fire. Um, I do a lot of study with prescribed fire. Many of you got, got, uh, in this room burned your hardwoods? A couple people burned? Okay. And yeah, we get a lot of questions about burning. There's a lot of different reasons to burn. And while I talk, you can look at this, and you can see this is sort of where I stand. If fire was the magic pixie dust, I would be up here. I would be standing on here and saying, burn your forest, and you will get oak, and you will sustain oak, and you will lifeboat those oaks. Believe me, if it was the magic pixie dust. I'm a researcher. I have not found it to be the magic pixie dust, dust yet. So we're still studying fire in these systems, and I'm going to give you uh, my two points of take home about fire. Kind of at the beginning with the silvical requirements, when you burn, if you're trying to favor one species over the other, you're going to burn everybody, right? You're going to burn the heads off the oaks and the maples. The premise is, is that the oaks have some kind of inherent ability to sprout back in the way they allocate their carbohydrates. They're going to do better than the maples, which might happen. We have burned a stand six times. The maples are out competing the oak in that stand, okay? Are the oaks sprouting back? Absolutely, but so are the maples. 
we get 20 sprouts on our oaks, we get 200 sprouts on our maples. So that's the first caveat. The second is I would caution you to think about the degrade that you might have to your residual stand. If you're going to harvest that stand within 10 years, that degrade that you might get from fire, fire store, or rot is minimal. If you're not going to harvest your stand within 10 years, you probably are going to have some degrade. There's been very little research on hardwoods with this. What has been done is out of Missouri, and that's kind of the take home from them. So managing for quality hardwoods, we've got to define quality. We have to define the species that we desire. Um, and we need to take into consideration the quality of the site you have and the past disturbance history. And you really need to think about the future of these crop trees in the future. Um, use your time wisely. Um, hardwoods take a lot of patience. So you might as well put that patience on trees that you really like. Uh, we do a lot of standing around in the field pointing, looking, and leaning. But I hope what we all are going to do is leave our stands better than we found them. Um, so that's really my take home. And this is a shameless plug for a short course we're going to put on. We put one on in Springville, Alabama. We're going to put another one on in Huntsville. It has to do with managing degraded hardwood stands or stands that have been picked over. Um, it's a little bit of lecture in-house, and then we go out in the woods and we talk about stand management. So we will make sure Lee gets the information for that as well. I am completely out of time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you.